How's everybody doing out there in YouTube land? I don't know if you've had your coffee and correct grammar yet today. But if you haven't had any, let's get some in you. I tried to advertise this live stream as best as I could. About a half hour. 40 minutes before I came on here. I'm not quite sure about live streaming at this particular time during the day. Like when I do premieres at about midnight Eastern Standard, I actually get pretty many viewers. But right now, it doesn't look like uh, anybody's here. I actually get, seem to get more over on TikTok than I do here on YouTube. Actually, on TikTok, I, I average about 300 viewers on those live streams. That's why you see me uh, live streaming over there rather than here. Uh, so, anyways, uh, push forward here. Uh, the purpose and function of this particular Coffee and Kirk Grammar is to open the floor to any viewers that pop on and decide they want to ask a question of me. Um, it doesn't matter what the topic is. It can be grammar. It can be whatever you want to ask or whatever you want to talk about. And we'll do that. I've set aside a block of now space to do this very thing. I'd also just like to sort of recapitulate on the webinar I did on August 8th, which is, yeah, it was last week. It was an awesome experience, I got to say. I mean, everybody that was there was top-notch, very respectful. A uh, lot of people, you know, I'd say about a third of the of the people participated and asked questions. Got some shy folks out there. I know that. I understand that. But of course, the more you put your foot in the water, the more you get used to it. So it's uh, it can be uncomfortable at first, that's for sure. And I gave a little bit of history about myself and my journey with correct sentence structure, where I started and all that stuff and where I came from how I developed the positions that I've developed, how I gained the knowledge that I gained, and the performances and all, all of those things. So that was cool. Um, I'm thinking about the next, I was thinking about doing the next seminar on Parse, and then another seminar on Syntax. However, I think I'm going to do the next seminar on the Live Life Claim. I'm going to concentrate on the Live Life Claim, like two hours of just going through the mechanics and, and how you would create a live life claim for yourself. And I don't mean by a live life claim. I mean you as your authority, you create it yourself using correct grammar. That might be, let's see, I gotta, there's a few ways I got to go about that because I'm totally, I don't agree with people charging money for live life claims. I def I've never agreed with it, and I don't agree with it now. I think everyone should have the opportunity to create their own live life claim, which they do. They do have that opportunity. The prerequisite to that is learning the grammar. And that makes most people turn around and walk the other way because they don't want to put in the time and the effort to learn the grammar. Over the last six or so years, I have found that for most people, learning this technology is a challenge and it is difficult. And most people, even if they start and they get to a certain point, give up because um, it can be frustrating at times. And this is what separates those who are successful with it from those who are not successful with it. It's kind of the same thing. I use the analogy of martial arts. You know, if you train every day or if you have experience 
you've been in there, you've been in actual physical confrontations, whether it's in the gym or on the street or wherever it is, then your success rate is, is going to go up exponentially. But if you have no experience, you've never done it. When all of a sudden you're put in that situation, it's not going to just magically appear. You're not just magically going to know what to do. You're probably going to freeze up and get your ass kicked. Um, that, that's probably what's going to happen. It's the same thing with correct sentence structure. If you don't do it every day, if you don't practice it every day, you don't learn, study, whatever, talk about it, then it, it's not going to take root in you. Um, as I remember from the fourth way teachings of G.I. Gurdjieff, you form within yourself what he called a magnetic center. Now, he used the terms of light magnetic center, dark magnetic center. I don't, I mean, that's opinion. What, what color it is doesn't matter. You're coloring the center. <laughs> With the, for, the center you form, you, you form a foundation. It's just a, a knowledge cultivation concept. You form within yourself a center of knowledge and skill, and it forms a foundation. And then you can build on that. And if your foundation is correct, if you have correct knowledge, then your foundation is strong and everything that you create or partake or participate with from then on will be strong as well because you have a solid foundation. There's no shaking going on. There's no doubt. But if you have a rotten foundation that is not correct, if it's built on any type of assumption or presumption, then anything you do after that is going to be on shaky ground. And more than likely, the first gust of wind that comes across comes across you is just going to knock you over. <laughs> it is what it is. That's how it happens. That's why you have to have such a strong foundation of grammar. Definitely. You have to learn the basics, the rudiments. And I would never, <clears throat> like, here, here's, here's the thing I will say. There is an individual out there who has, it's a very strange scenario. And I'll, I'll just go into this. Since no one's asking any questions or anything, I'll just start talking about different things. Because I, I don't really do it very often in live streams, but I will do it here for sake of argument. There is an individual out there who has a entire money-making system based upon him and his concepts and his ideas. He has a whole learning center that he authorizes that makes money for him. He has a Patreon account that makes money for him. But he separates himself from all of that. And if pressed about it, he will say something like, well, I don't have anything to do with that. I, I do my own thing over here. Whatever they do is what they do. And they, they don't, you know, I don't get paid for any of that. They, they get paid for it. They're doing their own thing. I don't have anything. It's sort of like relieving himself of responsibility or accountability for what's going on with the people that he's authorized to do to use his technology and what a shite technology it is that they're using over there and i'm not just speaking empty words i'm speaking based upon evidence go to the the website lastflagstanding.com look at the grammar on that website and it's shite there are mistakes all over. So you see the dichotomies there of what's going on. If you buy into that and you begin trying to build your knowledge base based upon what's being taught over there and you think that it's correct and then you actually wind up in a situation where you have to use that stuff and you have to think on your feet 
you're not going to be able to explain what you're doing. The only thing you're really going to be able to resort to is the old logical fallacy appeal to authority. Well, the federal, the chief said so. The chief said it. The chief, the chief's in charge. You guys all work for the chief. See how far that gets you. You see what I'm saying? It's a, it's a rotten foundation that you're building your stuff on. I don't know any other way to put it. And the same thing for that guy over across the pond, the lowercase k guy. Same thing, only much, much worse, being that they have no, I mean, forget about the grammar. I don't even know what they're doing anymore because they got kicked off of YouTube and I don't really follow, like I don't seek that stuff out. But if you look at the website that he has, or at least I looked at it a few months ago, same thing. Grammar is horrendous. It's atrocious. You build your construct on that and it's going to fall over the first gust of wind that hits you. The first challenge that you face, there's going to be problems. So I would liken it to, again, martial arts analogy where you go on Instagram and you see there's this one channel called McDojo. I think it's called McDojo where they show these uh, videos of these traditional Kung Fu or Kung Fu practitioners or karate people that are doing demonstrations. A good example would be the Steven Seagal thing. You know, the actor Steven Seagal who practices Aikido where it shows him with like, 10 guys attacking him and he's using one finger to flip him through the air and things like that. And he's the guy's like 300 pounds, but yet he's like moving around and wow, he's really tough. He can take care of 10 guys in a choreographed scenario in front of a crowd that paid to see it. Right. So if you take that type of martial art, Aikido, and you practice it for two, three years, every day, maybe. I don't know how long it takes to get what kind of belt. I don't even know if it's a belt system. But let's just say that there is. Say you reach the high level where where you reach what it would be a black belt or the equivalent of a black belt in a keto. And all you've done is train a keto. And you've never been in a fight in your life, a real physical confrontation. You've never been in one. And you, after five years, you think, well, I'm a black belt in Aikido. I'm a, I'm a pretty tough mf -er, right? Nobody's, I mean, I'll take care of anybody. I'll just use my finger and flip them through the air. And then you run into uh, a drunken college, collegiate wrestler who whose girlfriend just dumped him and he's, he's mad at the world. And you run into him in the parking lot at Kroger. And for some reason, he, he picks you. He wants to, to, to beat your butt. And you see he's coming. What are you going to do? All of a sudden, the next thing you know, you're on your back on the pavement getting your face smashed in because your little finger flip didn't work. Because you learned something that has actually no practical value or you thought that it did, but it doesn't. Because you never actually used it against a wrestler or a boxer or a kickboxer, or a Muay Thai guy, or, or well, let's just say mixed martial artist. Someone who trains in many different things. Krav Maga. I mean, it's the story I tell of uh, when I took two years of Shotokan karate when I was a teenager. Two years of Shotokan karate. I think I got up to yellow belt, green belt, something like that. I, I thought I was, you know, I thought I was Mr. Tough Guy. And then I ran into a a couple of Puerto Rican fellas who were boxers and they invited me to their boxing gym, which amounted to a basement with a heavy bag and some weights and stuff and a speed bag. And I went down there and got my butt beat. I got my butt handed to me. I realized I had knew nothing about fights, even after two years of Shotokan karate, nothing. And then after training for a week or two, Every day in that boxing gym, I went back to the Shotokan Karate Studio the next week and sparred my, my black belt sensei and whooped his butt with two weeks of boxing training. 
So it goes to show you what's quote unquote practical and what's not. If you're knowledge based, this is a very long story to get to this point. Your knowledge base must be, it must be solid. And if you're going to go over and learn from that learning center and stuff like that, looking at the grammar, the errors that I've pointed out in multiple videos, doing audits of their the last life standing website, documents, the the well, claim of the live life that they sell, doing a, a grammar audit of that. Um, you're going to learn that and think that you you have knowledge that's going to safeguard yourself and others. And then once you're put in a position, you realize all of a sudden you really don't know what you're doing because everything comes back to what one man says. Chief said so. Well, that's not going to get you very far. Wouldn't it be better and more comforting and wouldn't you have more confidence if you had the closure and you didn't have to say, it's well, it's because this guy said so. No, it's because I said so. Who's in charge here? Me. Not somebody else. So if you have a live life claim that has a copyright copy claim with uh, someone else's name in it, guess what? Your live life belongs to someone else. <laughs> if you have a live life claim with less than three witnesses on it, guess what? Those aren't correct mechanics, and it's going to fall apart, probably fall apart when put to the test. Okay? Especially if, I mean, there are so many things wrong with what I hear about how they sell live life claims over there, that now there's only one witness, and that witness doesn't even witness you. Witnessing someone means that you <clears throat> you see them. What does it mean to be a witness? When you witness a crime, it means you saw it. You were there. You looked at it. You heard it. You felt it. You smelled it. Whatever. You were right there. That's what witnessing is. How can... How can someone be a witness if they have a, like a stack of papers put in front of them? Oh, these are, you know, a thousand dollars worth of live life claimants. And then uh, the chief's like, okay, here, any autographs, thumbprints next, autograph, thumbprint next. He didn't witness anything. He didn't see you. If this is your live life claim, and he gets it through the mail, and then he autographs it and thumbprints it and sends it back to you. He didn't witness you. He witnessed this piece of paper, but he didn't see you. He doesn't know who you are. That's not a correct witnessing. It's just not. In order to witness someone on a live life claim, you at least have to do a video chat with them so that you can see them. They can see you. You can see that, yes, they are a living, breathing creature. They are who they say they are. They can hold up some other type of credentialing with their name on it and picture on it. And then you can match the picture to them. It's like, oh, that is who they are, who they say they are. I can now witness the live life claim. So they can send the live life claim to me. I'll autograph it, thumbprint it, and I'll send it back to them. And that is a correct witnessing. And you need three. Because three is trust. At least three. I mean, you can have more than three if you want but at least three, bare minimum three. And that would also be including you as live life claimant. Then there would be two other live life claim witnesses. And then people will say, well, I don't know anybody, you know, to, to witness me. I don't, are you sure about that? There is this thing called the internet that has lots of uh, forums and platforms where you can reach out to people find other live life claimants or find people who are interested in being live life claimants. You can create a, a video chat where there's three of you together looking at each other and you all have your live life claims in front of you, or, you know, this works for being in the same room too. And you can all witness each other, autograph your stuff, and then I'll take it down to the post office and boom, there you go. Three live life claimants created in one now space moment. It's easy. It's simple. Why don't people think of this? It's not, it's not, it's not complicated, folks. It just isn't. So now I got a few people here. Um, feel free to ask me whatever you want to ask me in here. 
doesn't matter what it is, if it's grammar related, if it's not grammar related, uh, I just ask, you know, go ahead and pop a comment in, a question, anything you want to talk about, and we'll get the conversation rolling. Because uh, it is about participating. At some point, you got to step onto the field if you're going to do this. I mean, if you don't want to do it, if you just want to stand back and just be an observer, that's cool too. Like I was just talking with a, with a buddy, and uh, they were saying that they haven't pulled the trigger on learning correct sentence structure yet because they have other priorities, you know, that need to be addressed, which I completely understand, especially if those things are life-threatening issues. Of course, you want to take care of that first if, you know, if that's what you want to do. Um, with this stuff, it's definitely better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. What is your closure of maybe? Mm. Man, Michael. That looks familiar. Well, let me look it up in the etymology dictionary. That's the first thing I would do because I've never used the word maybe in a correct sentence structure communication policy syntax grammar contract, Michael. Comes from May and B. So look up May. Old English M-A-E-G, which the A-E and the M-A-A-G is a digraph, meaning it's joined together. Have power from Proto-Indo-European M-A-G-H to be able, have power, same thing. So that's two is certification. Great. So then the other half of that would be B. In the context, it means to be, exist, grow. So maybe basically means to have the power to exist and grow. To be able to exist and grow. So there you go. That's my cursory closure on maybe, may be, two particles. May means, you know, the earliest Old English and things like that means to be able to have power. And then B means to exist and grow. So there you go. But I don't use that word in correct sentence structure contracts. If I'm using, I'm trying to think uh, one instance in a contract where I had to articulate something like two or more possibilities. Um, I use the word auxiliary, auxiliary. Is that how you say it? auxiliary? Like with the, this, with this claim or with this, with these claims or with these auxiliary hyphen claims, something like that, which would articulate two or more, or one or more. Um, I've used that, but I don't use maybe in any correct sentence structure contract. Never had to, a reason to. Usually contracts are, are concrete. But some, some, can, some can be open to uh, updating. Thank you for that question. That was a good question. So to, I guess, tidy up the last topic I was talking about. In order to be successful in using this grammar, you have to have a solid foundation, grammar foundation. And then after you've established that grammar foundation, then the next steps would be to get closure on the flag mechanics why you would use a flag, what that one by 1.9 grammar flag means. And you would also have to have a constitution for that flag, which 
It's not hard to find. What I did with it, um, Colin David, the late Colin David, I when Colin Miller sent me his flag constitution. And what I did is I took that and I corrected the grammar on it so that I have that constitution. When I use it, I can, I've never been called upon to present it. But if I did, I have it ready, right? Keeping my powder dry. And then you have to have closure on the, the postal mechanics, which are pretty simple. And then the banking mechanics, which just means the value that you're banking in the words, the facts, the symbols, the hieroglyphs, and everything that's on the document. The document contract post the best court venue. Those are banking mechanics. Fee for fray, banking mechanics. You have to have closure on all those things. And then when you do, everything else comes pretty easy. So I think that's going to be the next work uh, seminar I do is on the live life claim, how you can create one for yourself with correct grammar. I mean, during the Reno seminars, Colin Russell, hyphen J. Colin Gould hinted that Leighton Lionel's ward may not have had a live life claim, which I find baffling, being that Lane Lionel Ward was the clerk of the Federal Postal Court under Russell J. Gould and David Wood Miller. So if Layton was doing things incorrectly, then why did Russell approve him? Makes no sense. But then again, it doesn't make any sense that... Russell came out after David passed away and just besmirched the guy's name, said that he was making all these backroom deals, uh, saying that he gave up his flag, that his book is not correct, and saying all these things and saying going back to this year or that year. While David was supposedly doing these things, all these incorrect things, Russell was his partner. And they were doing seminars together. Russell never once spoke out until after David Windmiller passed away. Well, actually, that's not true. He started speaking out at the end of 2017 when he did that goofy court martial thing, military court martial of David, which Colin David Eiffelwin Colin Miller was never in the military. So you can't really military court martial someone. And Russell J. Gould was never in the military. So that makes absolutely no sense. Uh, adjective, adjective, pronoun, David Wynn Miller was in the military, yes, but not Colin David Eiffel Wynn Colin Miller. Colin David Eiffel Wynn Colin Miller didn't even exist when adjective, adjective, pronoun, David Wynn Miller was in the military. Think about that, folks. <laughs> so, but yeah, after David passed away, then Russell went full force in bottlenecking whatever the, the construct that they had. And that's when I came out and I started gaining traction because I definitely saw a bottlenecking going on. I saw that whatever status quo of the technology was that Russell was modifying it. He was changing it. He was hiding it. He was trying to take it away and put a price tag on it, basically, to make it exclusive. Just like... I guess sort of just like he was accusing David of doing that. He said that David's David was only going to teach it to the top 1%, like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers or who, whoever else, that that's what David was going to do. I mean, we don't know if that's true or not. We know that's what Russell says, but then Russell's doing the same thing by taking his little construct into the private and making people pay for it, pay for life. Paying for live life claims, that concept never existed until after David died. David came out with this technology in 1988. And up until he died, there was no mention of anyone paying for a live life claim. He would put it in his book. And it was also on his website for free. A version of it. If you wanted it. And then as soon as he died, Russell 
came out in the renal seminars and he said, I want to take down his website, stop publishing the book. He wanted to erase all that off the map so that he could, I'm guessing, bottleneck it and make money off of it in some way, shape or form. And that's when I came out in February of 2018, I began my grammar channels and began teaching. And so I hopefully, you know, I was able to balance some of that out. Rosvan says, can you share more about the Constitution? Well, yes, the correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, flag Constitution just contains details on the, the size of the flag, the ratio, how many stars are on the flag, how many stripes are on the flag, what the colors are, where the colors are, and also um, no modification, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's a regular flag constitution. If you've ever seen a flag constitution in the fiction, it's just that, but translated in the correct sentence structure. And again, if you're if you've reached that level where you have closure on the grammar, then that's definitely then probably something you're going to want to look into uh, creating or obtaining or writing as a flag constitution for that flag. And that's the thing that uh, you know some people perhaps don't quite get about this grammar it's it's a package there are mechanics in place it is a technology whether david Miller created it or not i don't know i just know that he brought it to the public and there are certain core concepts that need to be in place and the flag is one of them in order for you to be successful with it can you be successful without using that flag I don't think so. Maybe, but I don't think so. All the successes I've had, the flag's been on the document. Also, another thing that some people probably don't get is that in order to contract with correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, in which it's a bilateral contract. All the contract parties must be live life claimants with correct claim of the live lives. Must be. That's why people come to me and they say, well, Jason, you know, I'm a, I'm a landlord and I want to contract with my tenants using correct sentence structure. Well, if you want to do that 100% correct, then they must be live life claimants. Of course, the other side of that is you can't force them to be live life claimants because if you want to force someone to do something, then that, that makes you no better than the fiction system, which is all about force and forcing people to do things. With correct sentence structure, the only use of force is when someone is forcing someone else to stop trespass. It's just like if you're walking down the street and someone tries, to, you know, someone tries to rob me, I'm going to force them to stop or I'm going to do my best to force them to stop. That's the only time it's used. You would never use force to force someone to do something they don't want to do when there's been no trespass um, witnessed. Because that's what the fiction does. So it makes me laugh when people say, we need to, you know, make them use this grammar. We need to, you know, force it. Well, no, then that makes you no better than, than the fiction system. That's what those people over in Russell J. Gould's domain, that's what they like to do. Like that with that media command goofiness that they put out a couple years ago. They were commanding the media to do something like, really, like you're really going to tell someone else to do how to do their job. What gives you the authority to do that? And again, you know, I, I can't. It's all speculation, but something happened. During between the years 2016 and 2017. 
something happened there that the Russell J. Gould that was in the seminars and stuff with David up until that point, something happened that changed the way he presented things. His positions began changing for some reason. Something happened. That's my guess. Because that guy is not, I don't think is the same type of, you know, mental space that is the guy that began creating videos in 2017 with the court martial and stuff. I mean, for God's sakes, I saw the original court martial video in 2017. And at the end of the video, he's sitting there after he passes his judgment. And the guy, you know, the heavyset guy with the automatic rifle standing behind him. He's sitting there and someone says, strike the cavil. You can hear them say, strike the cavil. Then Russell's like, and he strikes the gavel. Someone had to tell him to do that. Folks, if you claim to be a federal judge and you're actually giving a judgment or you're supposed to be giving a judgment, you lift. That's the final thing you do. You lift that Masonic hammer because it is a symbol of them of, in masonry the hammer is part of the working tools for a mason and you strike that gavel if that's your thing man if you're using that system which that's another interesting thing ladies and gentlemen friends and neighbors why is russell using masonic tools i mean i got nothing against masonic tools i got nothing against a man or a woman using tools to better themselves and lift their brothers and sisters up. I'm nothing against that. But why is he doing it if he speaks out against Masons as if they're a bad thing? His mentor was a self-proclaimed 92nd degree Mason. Something's not right here, folks. Something's not right here with all that. Tom Foolery. So for me, the most important thing is the grammar. It doesn't matter what title someone claims, what hat someone wears. Are they using correct grammar or not? There are a lot of people out there not using correct grammar. I applaud people for taking steps to help share this knowledge, okay? But I'm also concerned about those who don't have closure on the grammar who are trying to teach it. Like, for example, this book right here that I did a reaction video to. The game of quantum syntax grammar. They can't even they can't even get the name right. It's correct sentence structure communication parsing syntax grammar. It's not quantum syntax grammar. <laughs> but this person right here doesn't even, I doubt they even have 25% closure on the grammar. But he says it's a book for getting started. This book is a work in progress and may not completely be up to date or correct. It is not correct. It is not even 3% correct. I hope that this helps people to get interested in grammar and to learn the grammar. But I also hope nobody takes what's taught in this book and actually tries to use it in a now space scenario where they could get into trouble because they will get into trouble. Hmm. What else was I going to talk about? That was sort of a tangent.
All right, let, let's take this for example, this uh, Lord's Prayer. From page 45 of David's book. It starts off, uh, For the people of the Father, and in a double forward slash, For the Father of the people. I think he's trying to imply that for the people of the Father, for the Father of the people, is like you're like taking it and writing it backwards, but that's that's not the way it would be written. If you're writing for the people of the Father backwards, it would be with the Father by the people, wouldn't it? <laughs> now anybody can have any type of um, religious spiritual system that they want. But what I'm concerned about is correct grammar. So when you are writing out something like a Lord's Prayer and you have a fact like Father and in correct sentence structure, one and one is one. So if you have a finite meaning for the word father in your dictionary, then that finite meaning would have to go spread across all of your contracts. So if you have a father and you give closure to that, that same finite meaning would have to apply to your, this, the father he's talking about here. Now, how would that work? Do you see what I'm saying? Oh my goodness. Well, if you have this book, you can check this Lord's Prayer out here if you want to. He also, which by the way, if you have the book, there is a section in here with part of Army Regs 840-10, which is all about flag protocols and stuff, which they sort of incorporate into their uh, construct here. But on the first page, well, the fourth page of the book is uh, a very primitive live life claim template. The grammar is not correct on here, just so you know that. So if you're going to use this, you're going to have to correct the grammar. It does have all the pertinent information on it, though. And there are actually four spaces for witnesses. Minimum, you need three, but you can have four. And it gives you a good idea of how it would be formatted. As a historical document, and historical document, it's fascinating. It really is. When I, when I bought this from David in 2017, I thought I had the Holy Grail. I would take airplane flights, and I'd be reading that book on the airplane, studying but it never really made much sense to me. Like there were so many contradictions in it. I was like, man, this is confusing. And then the more I learned from full colon, Raven, hyphen, Farhad, hyphen, Tahiti, colon, Afarin, the more I began to realize that the individual who wrote this book either didn't have closure on the grammar he was teaching or he was very careless and sloppy, or he was doing it on purpose. And I don't have an answer. 
as to which of those things it is. I have a guess, but I don't have an answer. And based upon documents I've seen, grammar performances, based upon the grammar performances of David's student and apprentice, Russell J. Gould, and based upon Russell's people and their grammar, I would have to say it's the first option that I gave. I know people are going to, that's going to send people spinning. But that's my knowledge cultivated guess. I don't know for sure. That's just my knowledge cultivated guess on which of those three options it is. Well, thank you for the great question, man, Michael. Thank you for the great question, Razvan. Does anyone else have any questions before I take off here? I appreciate the participation from those who had the mustard to step up to the step up to the plate and ask the questions. And again, I was open for any questions about anything. Doesn't matter what it is. If you're thinking about using this stuff, it's also a good idea to pad your knowledge with shipping mechanics, maritime law, learn about those things. It's always good to learn about the legal system and courtroom etiquette, Robert's rules and things like that. It's good to learn about those things. It may not be the way you do things, but it is the way the fiction does things, and it's good to have a basic rudimentary knowledge of how the fiction navigates. May your be so kind to share some ideas of concepts of postal mechanics, please. The basic concepts of postal mechanics, Jen, is fee for freight. Uh, with correct sentence structure, you would only use whole number value stamps on your documents. One dollar, two dollar, three dollar, four dollar, five dollar, six dollar, whatever it is. You would never use a fractional value because one and one is one. We're talking about whole facts here. So like the minimum value stamp that you would put on a document would be $1. For example, on this uh, book, you see that I put a Red Fox stamp on here. I put my punctuated name under David's punctuated name coming to join her for this book. I paid fee for freight and I am now qualified to carry that book wherever I go. It's not necessary, of course, to carry that book wherever you go. Um, but it adds value to it. The value of a thing is what you ascribe to it. And then of course, in the postal system, if you're going to be mailing a lot of documents and things like that, see, this is what I love to do with my postal station down the way, which I'm friends with the clerks there, with a couple of the clerks. I'm very friendly with them. I will have my registered mail documents all sealed up with the correct postage already on them, with the tape, all you know, all the edges and stuff all taped up and ready to go when I walk in there. And it blows their minds that I know how to do this. And I just know how to do it because I learned from them. So that, that would be one thing if you want to learn more about postal mechanics and go down to your local postal station and engage in a conversation with one of the postmasters down there, if not a postmaster, then a clerk. And talk to them about it. So the value of a document is what you put on it with the stamp like when i used to have the no trespass placard out in front of my house which i don't have out there anymore but i used to for a while there during the medical stuff that was going on i put a two dollar stamp on it on that and autographed over it and that would also reflect in the registered receipt that you keep similar to the one that you put on the back of your live life claim 
or your domicile claim or your fate rate volition claim or things like that. And again, I break the boxes on those things. And another thing about postal mechanics, when you see they put a bullet stamp on that receipt, I autograph over the bullet stamp. Just like if you have a passport, postal mechanics with passport, if you've uh, claimed your passport to tow as a salvage and you know those mechanics, those postal mechanics to do that, when you travel from country to country, then they put their stamp on one of the pages, then you would autograph over their stamp. Um, but you don't have to do it while they're looking at you. You can do it later on somewhere else. Because I do know I caution people out there who want to do this. Some of those countries get a little bit upset if they see you autographing over their stamp, their bullet stamp. So just be careful with that. Don't say I didn't warn you. This information is for educational and entertainment purposes only. What you do with it is up to you. And I would highly recommend not doing anything with it unless you have closure on the grammar. 100% closure on the grammar. You know it like the back of your hand and you can teach it to someone else. But those are more postal mechanics for you. That's sort of like what the CPAS-C treaty is. Is uh, Or even a simple postmaster badge that you can make. Not necessarily CPAS-C treaty, just a postmaster badge with FIFA Freight on it. So you're basically using, <laughs> you're the postmaster of yourself, mailing yourself from location to location. But again, you know, I'm not going to go too, too in-depth on these things because I don't know the knowledge level of some of the viewers here. And some of these things, like the thing I just shared about the passport, I was kind of leery about doing that because if someone does that and they don't know what they're doing, they could be put in jail. And have their passport taken from them. If you don't know what you're doing. Anytime. You. Come into contact with the fiction system. Whether you're traveling or banking or whatever. And you do something that they're not used to. You're probably going to get static. It's probably going to mess you up their day and perhaps your day, depending upon your attitude towards it. Like if I'm going to travel and I'm going to use correct sentence structure in certain venues, I prepare for it. I'm prepared to add a few extra hours onto my day dealing with these people when I do it. There is no rushing this. When you're in the now space, you're in the now space. There is no future. There is no past. There is no schedule to keep. It could take a very long time to explain these things to people, especially if you get detained or put in a sally port or something like that. And you, you, you really get put on the spot. You have to be ready for that. Now, of course, the more you do it, the less that happens for whatever reason. But if you're just starting out, you got to be prepared. You got to give yourself some extra, allow for extra now space because you're going to probably be putting on a, a mini seminar with these people to teach them. I asked the kind clerks to add our names to each receipt and bullet stamp them. Rosvan, um, why wouldn't you just add the name yourself? Why would they? What, what difference does it make if they add the name or you add your name? Because I, I would think if, just thinking in terms of logic, you know, and authority, if you're authority of you, why wouldn't you add your name? And then they add their name or their bullet stamp or whatever credentialing they have. Why would they do that for you? Just curious. 
What purpose does that serve? Because I mean, if, it, if there's something extra there that maybe I don't know about it. So what is the value of them adding your name rather than you adding your name? That's my question, I guess. Like when I get a receipt from the post office, I uh, thumbprint it and autograph it. Depending on what it is. If I'm just buying stamps and I get a receipt, I'm not going to autograph and thumbprint that. I mean, what's? <laughs> it's all practical. I've shown this before. This is my correct sentence structure, communication, parsing, syntax, grammar, claims, ledger. Starting in April, let's see. I started keeping this in the, at the near the beginning of 2018. It's all written in correct sentence structure. And it's a record of all the correct sentence structure claims I've taken down to the post postal station. All written out in correct sentence structure, detailing the fee for freight, the dates, the postal clerks, names or credentialing numbers, so on and so forth. It's all contained in that book, handwritten. I try to keep the best records that I can of everything. And I would suggest the same thing for those of you out there who are really serious about this. Keep records of everything, every single thing that you're doing as far as this grammar goes. It's just like I keep records of everyone that I have consultations with or do workshops with. I have their correct name, and then I have a file folder with them, and then I type out observations about them, their knowledge level, their personality, different things that they say that stick out to me so that I know in the future if someone contacts me like that and they say, hey, this is so-and-so, I can look them up in the in my file and be like, oh, this this person. Why is this person acting that way? Oh, I got that impression when I first met them or blah, 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 you know. It's just part of the vetting process. So if, you had, if you've had a consultation with me, you're in my ledger. That way no one can come out and make fraudulent claims against me saying I did this, that, or the third. I have it all on file on record. Everything. I saw they had room for buyer's name and I thought it was still more closure. Why leave it blank? Hmm. So what's the difference between you putting your name in the buyer's name section and them putting your name in the buyer's name section? I guess is what I'm asking. What, what is the value of them doing it rather than you doing it? A, 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 A. Hi there, Jason. When does one has closure on the grammar? When does one have closure on the grammar? Well, I guess it would depend upon whether you, when you have no more questions about it, when you're completely confident about it, you know what an adverb is, you know what a verb is, you know what an adjective is, you know what a pronoun is, you know why adverbs modify adjectives and verbs, you know why adjectives modify other adjectives and pronouns, so on and so forth. When you know all those things, when you know the 10 parts of speech, when you know the correct sentence structure concatenation, 
uh, when you have a correct claim of the live life. There's a lot of things that go into it, but one sure way I can tell you that I can certify your knowledge level is if you contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com and apply for a test. I have a 10 to 15 minute grammar test that I've been giving out for the past year or so. And if you have closure on the grammar, you should be able to complete that test in 10 to 15 minutes. And I've had about half a dozen people take it and nobody's passed it. You have to, to have closure on the grammar. You have to be able to use it lightning quick. You have to be able to come up with correct sentence structures on the spot. Impromptu, you have to be able to syntax. You have to know why you're banking syntax values you're banking. You have to know the five syntax patterns. So it's like, I guess you could say, uh, when do you have closure on uh, how to do multiplication? When do you have closure on how to drive a car? When do you have closure on how to box? Well, thank you very much for your offer. I'm willing to do that and still watching your videos. Or, of course, you know, if you're really serious about it, you can apply for the workshops that I provide. I have a set curriculum I've been teaching since February of 2018. Of course, that curriculum has advanced and gotten more specific and things like that. I tailor the workshops to each individual student. However fast you're motivated to learn it is how fast the workshops will go. But you have to contact me at jasonmatthewg17 at gmail.com for further questions on that because they are confidential workshops. There's nothing in the workshops that's not available for free on the YouTube channel, though. And most people go for the freebies. The majority of people prefer to go for freebies. So I just offer that because, you know, the most serious people will apply for a workshop. And I do feel that while someone can get 75 to 80 percent closure on the grammar from just studying my videos, they do need a tutor for that last little bit. I know I did. Gosh, if I wouldn't have had a tutor, I would have never gotten to where I am. And also, as I said in the uh, TikTok live stream yesterday, you got to vet your tutor as well. Just like I vet you, you got to vet your tutor. Ask them questions. Ask them some hard-hitting questions and see how they react to those questions. Man, I've heard horror stories of... Uh... <laughs> I know a guy in another country who was trying to learn grammar from the entity formerly known as the Red Thumb Club. There was a guy up there that was, I guess, offering to tutor people. And this tutor went to the guy's house in person. And the student ended up kicking the teacher out of his house, had to physically remove the guy from his house because he was asking the tutor some questions that the tutor didn't have an answer to. And the tutor got very, very angry and started yelling, it's because Russell J. Gould says so. It's the way we do it. And the dude had to kick him out of his house. So it's a good idea to, to vet your, your teachers. If they react like that, then you know they don't know what the hell they're talking about. And who would want to be taught like that anyways? Another one. Um, I had a couple guys from, I think they were from New Jersey, who said that they were being tutored by one of the same people from the Red Thumb Club. You may recall the name, Colon Gordon hyphen Michael Colon Schiller. And this Schiller guy literally called these two guys stupid to their face during a tutoring session. <laughs> so. I mean, if that's the type of teaching you like, I mean, that's up to you. But I do advise you, you vet your teachers. I can tell you, even without the grammar, the now space, and overall knowledge and awareness of syntax on its own has power to halt the fiction in small issues. 
I feel like you're not talking about syntax. I feel like you're more referring to parse. Because that's what I advise people to do if they don't have closure on the grammar. Anyone can use parse and make an attempt to stop a trespass. And by parse, I mean point out the particles of negation in a contract. Like the REs, the EDs, all the no contract particles. Um, yeah, it's not syntax. That's the thing that the Mark Lowercase K Kishon Christopher people get confused because he confuses it. I don't know if he knows the difference. He uses parse as synonymous with syntax when, as far as I know or can tell, he doesn't know how to syntax, but he uses that word synonymously, interchangeably with parse. They are not the same thing, friends and neighbors. Parse is completely different than syntax. And it's very easy to parse. It's the easiest thing to do. It's what most people do first. Like when I started my YouTube channel, I started doing parse videos because it was the easiest thing to start doing. Anyone can do it, but not anyone can syntax unless you learn it. And it takes a while. And you have to learn those concepts of tangible contract versus non-tangible contract using parse to do that, to credential the words. So, cool. Thank you for your participation, AAAA. Interesting choice of nom de guerre. Thanks, everybody, for the participation. It was good to see some familiar faces like Rosvon, Jens, and even colon man, comma, space, Michael. Appreciate everybody being here. The reason I wanted them to write it is just like I can show some fiction document to show that my LLC name is the name I use in general. I also autograph my name. Thank you, SD. This is my now to care account. I have contacted you previously on your email location. Well, that's cool, A, 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 but I have no idea who you are <laughs> unless you credential yourself. So I guess I'll just have to take your word for it. Thanks, everybody. Peace. Have a great day. Thank you again. Much appreciation for the subscribers, for the likes, for the comments. Uh, peace out. If you'd like to learn correct sentence structure, communication, parse, syntax, grammar, contact me at the email address listed at the bottom of your screen. I will set up a 10 to 15 minute video consultation between you and me. You can ask me whatever you like and I'll do the same and we'll see if this is something that uh, you're prepared to commit to. If you'd like to support the channel, click on the join button underneath this video. There are two tiers of membership. Uh, the second tier has access to exclusive content not available to the public. Once again, Thank you for watching. Uh, hit the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Turn the notification bell to all so that you don't miss any of my premieres because I do post on a very consistent basis. There are over 500 correct sentence structure videos for here you to study on this channel. My gift to you, my fellow mankind. Thank you again, and I'll see you in the next one.